Dear colleagues, professor, lecturers, researchers, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to be speaking to you today and I'm looking forward to connecting with you. I'm attending SB60 meetings, thus I cannot present live at the conference. I'm Dr. Renuka Thakur, founder and CEO of the Global Sustainable Futures CIC and the director of our, the Center for Social Legal Studies at the University of Central Langshire, UK. Over the past three decades, I have transferred my knowledge between academic and non-academic realms, working on Asian, European, South American, and African continents. My engagement spans several prestigious organizations such as European Union, the African Union, UN agencies, and international communities and universities. For the past 17 years, I have been at the front forefront of international communities, advising and uh, assisting them through climate change ad mitigation and adaptation particularly during my time in the UK. In the last three and a half years, I have provided strategic leadership and support to learning and knowledge management at the secretarial and platform level, which is a unique platform, bringing multilateral, multilevel people worldwide and in a networking platform which is the unique platform bringing, uh, trying, having a mission to mainstream climate adaptation and mitigation approaches in the global South. Go creating sustainable, resilient and equitable futures. Our coordinators engage with diverse sections and societies committed to delivering evidence-based contributions to sustainable development goals and leaving no one behind. GSFN actively fosters knowledge management and learning processes through various channels, including webinars, workshops, seminars, conferences, summits, and social media. We contribute constructively to research, development, demonstration, and knowledge transfer in climate technologies, building environment, waste, energy, environment, carbon supply chain, life cycle, biodiversity management, circular economy, and corporate social responsibility. On behalf of the GSFN, I express my sincere gratitude and welcome you to the conference of Beyond Oil. I'm grateful to Dilu Tobechukwu, the co-founder of Lynch Green Prospects, who invited me to be being among you. I'm very thankful to the media partner, the host partner, and other partners who have generously ex extended their support. I know Dilu Tobechukwu has worked very hard for this day and deserves our uh, appreciation. The theme, igniting innovation, exploring new economics is very timely. And I will focus on this while I speak on the role of stakeholders in helping communities in Niger Delta adapt to the effects of climate change that is building resilience and reducing vulnerability. It might not be a news to most of you present here that the second largest delta in the world, the Niger Delta region of Nigeria is under threat of losing over 15,000 square kilometers of land by the year 2100 due to climate change, include coastal ero erosion and floods. Coastal vegetation, especially the mangroves, been lost to coastal erosion while settlements in the region displayed by coastal erosion. The in in inundation arising from the rise in sea level will increase pro problems of floods, 
intrusion of seawater into freshwater sources and ecosystem destroying such stabilizing system as mangroves and affecting agriculture, fisheries, and general livelihoods. Meaning at least 80% of the people of this region will be displaced. So the roles of institutions and stakeholders in addressing the challenge of climate change and environmental degradation in the region becomes crucial. We need to create a community that is well informed about climate change and thus able to make sustainable, responsible decisions and choices. The challenge is to engage people in the climate change debate in order to break down some of the barriers that exist and to connect people to the role that their attitude and lifestyle plays in causing the problem and working towards solution. This challenge is not unique to the Niger Delta region. Most parts of the world, especially Global South, experiences this challenge. I recognized this need three and a half years ago and I have created a free platform worldwide for people to engage. GSFN welcomes stakeholders from every section of the society. This is because I believe that each one is the stakeholder in addressing the problem and shaping solutions for climate change. Only then we can ensure leaving no one behind. Stakeholder involvement is an essential component of climate change adaptation plan. As climate change affects a very wide section or segment of the society, consider involving a wide range of stakeholders, assessing vulnerability to climate impacts at local and regional level and developing adaptation options are strongly based on the involvement and the knowledge of the local stakeholders, stakeholders diversity, including community members, policy makers, researchers, experts, civil society, non-governmental organizations, and media. Local community members have valuable knowledge about consequences of the low climate change impacts, and many of the adaptation options are already familiar to them. However, they are not explicitly recognized as helping to reduce vulnerability to climate change. Building on the familiarity of these actions increases the empowerment of local communities and decision makers as they can see themselves as valuable sources of knowledge of, and for developing responses to the climate change. Moreover, the key stakeholders must have representation across sectors, genders, and available capacities. It is equally important to help stakeholders remain active in process, and this requires incentives, and strong leadership. At GSFN, we have established a developed, uh, we have developed a unique governance structure, inviting multiple stakeholders to take responsibility. We provide them a chair badge and they become the chair of their own expertise. The unique chair is defined by six elements. The first one is SDG number, the number that the stakeholder wants to impact. I know SDG numbers are interdependent. Thus, you may not be able to decide or, on any one SDG, but I suggest you select the SDG that drives your action. Think if it is poverty or education or health or climate change live on land or live in water, life in water, or is it partnership or strong institution? What drives your motivation to be a stakeholder for changing or addressing climate change? 
The second one is the domain, which I call, which falls under your activities. Where your activities fall, that you need to think, whether it is education, research, enterprise, or community. Third one is the level. The level at which the, you can make the most impact. It could be global, country level, community, community level, or maybe it is tribe tribal level or indigenous level or a sector level or uh, any any level that you think that you can make the most impact and then we ask you to put three specific words that prescribes your expertise these six elements define your activities and impact you continue to do these activities that you have been doing so and that uh, However, we tell you to think of a positive impact on the society and addressing the climate change. At the end of the year, we ask all chairs to submit a self-nomination form and we give them awards accordingly. In last three years, we have awarded about 500 awards, mobilizing the capacity to impact the local and global issues only through motivation, appreciation and accreditation. We have been delivering structured and non-structured dialogues related to climate change and sustainable development goals, connecting to 1.5 million stakeholders globally through 7,000 coordinators from 170 countries. We have delivered more than 1,500 hours of online videos and more than 2,000 media posts, contributing to 150 high-level dialogues and winning six prestigious awards. Recently, I have started Global South Capacity Building Summit. We have an innovative summit structure. Our st summits are mainly online, but we also encourage institutions to bring their colleagues at one local venue and join us online meaning we are decreasing the use of computers and carbon emission at the same time. And these local people join us online, so we also uh, decrease the travel emissions and maximizing the reach to the communities. Anyone can join the summits. Not only they can be the audience, but we invite people to be speakers, key speakers, theme leaders, and program proposers. Again, I repeat, there is no cha change of any activities uh, uh, undertake, I mean, no charge, sorry, no charge for any activities undertaken by GSFN. We want to maximize our reach and able to provide opportunities to everyone to engage with the environmental and climate change dialogue. I also recognize the economic activities of the people in the Niger uh, Delta region include fishing, farming, and trading. Gross national product per capita in the region is below the national average of 280 US dollars. The rural population commonly fish or practice substantial, uh, substantial agriculture and supplement their diet and income with a wide variety of forest products. Education levels are below the national level and are particularly low for women. The poverty level in Niger Delta is exacerbated by the high cost of living. In some parts of Niger Delta and the cost of living index is the highest in Nigeria. Addition to this, the impact of climate change and sea rise is the emergence of health related hazards for the farmers and his family. Climate change is increasingly stressing coastal communities in the region, worsening and existing strains of development and pollution. It is pity to know that the second largest delta, uh, delta is being in such deprivation situation. 
And I propose an innovative program, again, undertaken by GSFN, which is Community's Carbon Calculator. In this calculator, we are using carbon as one unit and a means of language, a common language that can be used by each and everyone in the world. Any activity you do can be translated into how much carbon emission it makes. Today, with the development of carbon emissions calculators or carbon emission factors around the world, we can do that. And therefore, I suggest four interventions for communities' carbon calculators. And they are, first one is carbon literacy. I believe that today the world needs carbon literacy. It is just as the need 100 years or 200 years ago we had recognized for the need for literacy, where we thought that each and every person must know a language, must know numbers to communicate. And that is what a, today the situation is such that each and every citizen or each and every person should know what is carbon literacy or should be carbon literate. Secondly, carbon literacy or carbon measurements, uh, carbon literacy will allow us everyone to measure their carbon. If you know your measurement, if you know your budget, you will know where to spend. And that is what we want to do from carbon literacy, want to come to carbon budgeting. And then from, if we know what is our carbon, we will know where are the pockets of carbon emissions and where, where we can store carbon. And that is how we can mobilize the carbon. And that is what we want carbon mobilization. And that can also be credited for people who, change their practices from high carbon to low carbon practices. And finally, we want to live into carbon sustainability framework so that we continue to live within 1.5 degrees centigrade. These changes can become, as they are connected to quantitative and qualitative measures, they can be widely accepted and can be a language for decision making of sustainable practices. That is what I want to say today. I believe the thought for food uh, for you, a uh, food for thought this time, and uh, that is where I think I can stop. Thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, my uh, contact details will be available to you. Thank you very much.